BizTech's Leadership Conversation Show. Today, our Leadership Conversation focuses on giving and philanthropy. And to bring an expert global lens to the conversation, we have Derek Ray Hill. He's the Director of International Strategy for Charities Aid Foundation. The Charities Aid Foundation is a registered UK charity that operates in the United Kingdom, the United States, as well as Canada. Now to tell us more, Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, Derek, for a start, can you give us an overview of the Charities Aid Foundation and its mission? Absolutely. The Charities Aid Foundation has been in existence for 99 years now, and we exist to accelerate progress in society towards a fair and sustainable future for all. What that means in practice is we deliver two things. We help donors give, whether they're corporates, wealthy individuals, or the general public. And we also help charities thrive. Okay, could you shed some light into could you could you shed some light into how you help them give and how do you help charities thrive? Thank you. Yes. Uh we help people give uh, primarily through donor advised funds or payroll giving uh, in the United States, uh, Canada, and in the United Kingdom. And in the year that we have just finished accounting for, we helped people give over a billion pounds worth of donations via those platforms to a charity in over a hundred different countries around the world. A lot of that giving is domestic but a lot of it is also international, by which we mean a donation directly from a donor based either in the United Kingdom, the United States or Canada to a not-for-profit project or organization based in another country. And then when it comes to our services for charities, in the United Kingdom, we offer a range of charitable services, including a commercial bank called CAF Bank, designed specifically to meet the needs of small to medium-sized charities. This is effectively a corporate banking service, but only for charitable organizations. In addition to that, we offer a range of reports and campaigns on behalf of the sector to ensure the sector continues to be vibrant, high growth, and delivering the kind of transformational change donors would like to see. Now, Derek, to help the understanding of our audience. Now, I'm going to wear the hat of a family office, a very high net worth individual. I've got a family office, and I want to understand your ecosystem of partners and stakeholders. Walk me through that. So we deal with a wide range of people who basically come to us, often having decided more or less what types of not-for-profit organizations they want to support. Uh, but typically, they want to be a bit more dynamic, a bit more impactful, and they want their giving to be a bit more sustainable than would be without the kind of independent advice or interme intermediary services that we provide. So you know, a typical example is that someone has a, a corporate partnership program, for instance, in the United Kingdom, and they focus on education and employability skills. Uh, they also, for instance, have uh, outsourced services in the ASEAN region, uh, perhaps in you know, Indonesia, for instance, or, or Malaysia. And they wish to adapt those two themes to the local ecosystem and find charities to support that deliver against those themes in, in Malaysia and Indonesia. And we have partners in this region, in the ASEAN region, who are independent of the Charities Aid Foundation, who will help advise and guide them on that. Now, okay, that's interesting. That's a lot clearer now. Now, you have an international role, in, a role in, in CAF. What's your strategy now moving forward in terms of, of getting out of the, the three main countries that you are actually involved in? So our, our main strategy right now is to help galvanize global wealth and uh, corporate influence towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So if we look at the figures I just mentioned, a billion pounds sounds pretty impressive to lots of different people, but anyone listening this uh, to this show or, or watching it, you know, the entrepreneurs, the, the billionaires, the, the millionaires, the successful business people will know that's a drop in the ocean compared to global need. 
we have at least a 45 trillion in US dollars deficit in funding for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So a billion pounds just doesn't quite do it. And so our main focus is to expand the amount we give and as much as possible to inspire donors to use the framework of the SDGs and other sub frameworks to really help ensure their donations are not just delivering the kind of value they want, the feel good factor, the sense of benevolency that everybody loves, but also genuinely making the most long lasting, sustainable and impactful contribution to society they possibly can. And, and which brings me then to making an impact and giving, where giving actually sometimes comes from sources that we don't think necessarily uh, about. Actually, people who are less than wealthy, you actually talk about and, and, and publish the World Giving Index. Tell us about the World Giving Index and, and what is the criteria for actually the index ranking? So the World Giving Index has been going for 13 years now, and it uses data collected around the world. Over the course of those uh, 13 years, roughly 2 million people have been polled via the Gallup World Poll. And Gallup asked people in their country three questions. In the last month, have you given to a charitable organization? Have you volunteered your time for charitable purpose? Or have you helped a stranger? Each of those categories is tabulated and cross-referenced. And the percentage of people that answer yes to those three questions is the indicator of how highly you will rank in the World Giving Index. And to your point before, I mean, it's absolutely true that the World Giving Index, one of its most inspiring outcomes is that you do not have to be an especially rich or even an especially stable country to have an immensely generous national culture. And you don't all your the size of your economy, your culture, your predominant religious beliefs in country, all of those are hugely diverse and variable. In the most recent edition that we have just released, Indonesia ranks first for the sixth consecutive year. The United States is fifth. The United Kingdom is 17th. Kenya is second. Liberia is fourth. So there is just a wide range of countries. Oh, forgive me, by the way. I, 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 I misspoke. Uh, the, the Ukraine is second and Kenya is third. So to recap, the top four are Indonesia, Ukraine, Kenya and Liberia. And Liberia now, is one of the poorest countries, at least developed countries in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And none of those countries are, you know, right at the top of your sense of wealth, influence and, and global power. Indonesia is a huge country and hugely important. And of course, the Asian region, if taken together, would be one of you know, the, the great uh, powerhouses of geopolitical uh, influence. But the truth is, you know, what it shows is that, you know, a place like Ukraine, which has, of course, been through huge turmoil and disruption, we can only imagine unless we're there, has come in 10th last year and now second this year. Uh, Kenya and Indonesia have very consistently been towards the top in the last few years. And, and, and we believe that's because there's a range of influences culturally to encourage giving and more importantly, to encourage people to talk about their giving. Uh, in both places. Now, one of the things that's happened, of course, is uh, in the Asia Pacific region where we're focused on really is the explosion of wealth generated in the region. You you look at you, you look at places like Singapore, for example, which have become which has become literally one of the global hubs after Switzerland for wealth management, with the the, the establishment of over a thousand family offices over the last couple of years. Now, how is how are you involved in perhaps then encouraging that giving culture in perhaps a more sophisticated manner? We work with partners all over the world. And one of our jobs, one of the purposes of our charitable mission is to share knowledge, experience, 
our our track record in terms of what we've done that's worked and also what we've done that hasn't worked uh and and just share everything from detailed nuts and bolts policies in the united kingdom and north america that we believe have helped to encourage more giving uh right through uh to larger campaigns uh for instance we have a, a current campaign around disaster and crisis relief in which you know it is possible as either a corporate donor or an individual to decide that you will give to disasters, even if you can't immediately predict what the next disaster will be, and to make contingency plans so that those donations are ready to go much more rapidly than if you just respond to the news cycle. So and essentially our role in Singapore is mm -hmm. to meet, to share with the many excellent organizations and independent uh, experts in, in Singapore uh, so that they can use anything that's useful to them from our experience to influence their own clients, their own donor communities, and their own charities. And Derek, that's a very interesting thing because I think the traditional high net worth individual would not think of donating for disaster recovery in advance or, 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 or disaster mitigation and stuff in advance. Correct. In Asia, for example, traditionally, because of cultural reasons, people tend to uh, be involved in philanthropy when it's related to education in particular, uh, mm -hmm. because of the fact that education is seen as the tool for social mobility. Mm. So, so it's interesting that you mentioned uh, uh, getting high net worth individuals to, or, and, and corporations to donate to disaster relief, because that is a big problem. There's always a problem. But I think that a lot of, of, of corporations don't think about even donating to that in uh, Absolutely. And it's a natural human thing. Uh, the truth is also, you know, there are very sophisticated tools uh, delivered by all sorts of independent bodies that will actually predict where disasters are likely to occur. The time window can be quite wide, depending on what type of disaster uh, we're speaking about. And of course, when we're talking about human generated disasters, such as wars and other types of conflict and oppression, you know, those are down to geopolitical factors and circumstance that are unpredictable to a point. But there's no doubt that if you look at uh, things like civil wars and internal conflicts around the world, they do tend to reoccur in some parts of the world versus others. So for all those reasons, the first step that someone can say, either as a corporate, can make either as a corporate or as an individual is, I know I like to give to people affected by disaster and crises. Once you've said that, there are all sorts of mechanics, depending on where you're based in the world that allow you to effectively put funds in a vehicle prepared to give to charity already, if you will, in the charitable space and awaiting the time when you're going to want to use them for disaster relief and recovery. It's also true that there are a range of issues and themes and causes that people don't associate with disaster, but have quite a material effect on how well any community is going to survive a disaster. Things like uh, housing, for instance, infrastructure, flood defense, uh, maritime infrastructure are all key components. Anything to do, for instance, with climate change ultimately is a form of disaster prevention, whether on the micro level, because you're in an area that experiences much more turbulent meteorological events as a result of climate change, or on a macro level, when you're dealing with rising global temperatures. So disaster preparedness involves having money prepared to give to disasters and thinking in advance about who those partners might be. But it also involves giving longer term to some of the causes you've mentioned to me. And the more educated your population, the more employed your population, and as a result, in all likelihood, the more resource that will be available to your community to invest in disaster recovery as well. Derek, this has been a fascinating conversation. We could probably go for the next one hour and, 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 and have a great conversation, but we've run out of time. Before we leave, however, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? All giving is worth it. And giving makes people fulfilled and happy. And if you're in a larger organization, a corporate entity or community group or whatever, those benefits are even magnified 
more. When polled in the United Kingdom, you know, over half of people say they would rather work for an organization that they think of as being generous, that they think of as being involved in the community. And so there are lots of benefits to giving that go beyond the gift itself. And there's a lot of happiness that is created in the act of giving and fulfillment that is created in the act of giving that is almost immeasurable, but in another way, quite evident quite tangible. So I would encourage everyone to keep up the good work. And I would leave you with this piece of extremely good news. 4.2 billion people around the world, over 70% of the world's population had done something charitable in the month that the polling was conducted for the World Giving Index. And that's phenomenal. We have never been more generous as a global community. And when you think about some of the political uh, headwinds and the uh, international tensions and uh, the crises caused by natural disasters and political disasters, if you will. I think that's just phenomenally reassuring to all of us. Derek, thank you very much for taking your time to come on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for listening or watching me, everybody who's out there. We've been speaking to Derek Ray Hill. He's the Director of International Strategy at the Charities Aid Foundation. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to BizTech's Leadership Conversation Show. Catch this conversation and much more on BizTech's uh, website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.